Hello everyone and welcome to another video on our own devices. I'm Jean Messier and today we are looking at a fascinating piece of photography history, a Cine Kodak Model B home movie camera. Now thus far on this channel I've hesitated to cover home movie cameras despite a large number of them passing through my hands over the years. This is because there are literally hundreds of different models out there and to do a comprehensive overview of the evolution of the technology would be a rather daunting task. For that reason, I've mainly stuck to the most unique examples, specifically World War II gun cameras and the Polarvision system. Links to those videos in the description. And this is yet another exception, because the Cine Kodak was actually the very first home movie camera and the first to use 16mm film to hit the market, all the way back in the 1920s. So, without further ado, let's dive right in. Now, the first model, Cine Kodak, was released in June 1923 alongside 16mm reversal safety motion picture film, which was designed to be safer and more convenient for the average consumer to use. Now, in addition to being a lot more compact than regular 35mm film, being a reversal film, it could be directly processed into a projection-ready positive image without a negative intermediary, and being made of safety cellulose acetate film stock, it was less flammable than the traditional cellulose nitrate film stock. The original version of this film was orthochromatic, meaning it was sensitive to blue and green wavelengths, but not red, and had a sensitivity of around ISO 4 to 5. This was soon followed by panchromatic film, whose color response more closely matched that of the human eye, and had a sensitivity of ISO 8 to 10. Finally, in 1935, Kodak developed an even more sensitive panchromatic film at ISO 15 to 20. An interesting parallel development was Kodak Color Film, introduced in 1928. This was a special black and white film used in conjunction with a red-green-blue grid filter fitted over the lens. Depending on the concentration of color, every area of the emulsion would be differentially exposed so that when the developed film was projected back through the same filter grid, the color image would be reconstructed. And to learn more about how color film works, please check out my videos on Polaroid and specifically the Polavision system. Links again in the description. In 1935, however, Kodak Color was supplanted by the more famous Kodachrome, which did not require the use of a separate filter. Now, as for the Cine Kodak camera itself, the first prototypes were made out of leather-covered wood, just like Kodak still box cameras, but this was later changed to die-cast aluminum for the production versions. This first model was hand cranked, the crank being geared so that you had to turn it twice per second to achieve the standard frame rate of 16 frames per second. At that rate, a standard 100 foot reel of film would be used up in about 4 minutes. Now, of course, achieving a constant frame rate cranking by hand is very difficult, and so the following year, Kodak introduced an electric motor attachment powered by a rechargeable wet cell battery. Unfortunately, this proved very cumbersome and difficult to use, and was discontinued only two years later. Instead, Kodak introduced two new hand crank accessories, one that took a single frame for every turn of the handle, for example for making animated films or taking time-lapse footage, and one that upped the frame rate by four times to 64 frames per second for doing high-speed or slow-motion work. The first Cine Kodak was available in one of two fixed 25mm lens options, f3.5 or f1.9. In 1927, an interchangeable mount was introduced, but again, only two lens options were offered, 25mm f1.9 or 78mm f4.5 telephoto. Originally, the Cine Kodak was sold as part of a complete outfit which included the camera, a tripod, a projector, and a film splicer. This sold for $335, or around $6,700 in today's money, a huge sum roughly equivalent to the cost of a brand new Ford Model T with electric starter. Needless to say, although the Cine Kodak was intended to bring movie making to the masses, this high price point kept it out of the hands of all but the wealthiest amateurs. In 1925, however, Kodak released a new version of the Cine Kodak with a spring motor similar to that found in phonographs, which allowed a consistent frame rate to be achieved without the complexity of a battery-driven motor. This was the Model B, with the previous version uh, being redesignated retroactively the Model A and marketed to advanced amateurs. So, let's actually have a closer look at the Model B, and let me show you how it works. So, this comes in a nice leather case, and if we pull this out, we can see the name Cine Kodak embossed on the leather carrying handle and stamped onto the nameplate, along with the words Model B at Rochester, New York by Eastman Kodak Company and made in the USA. The plate also includes a footage counter window. Staying on the top surface, we also have a pair of flip-up drag viewfinders, 
and a waist level reflecting viewfinder. Moving to the front of the camera, you could be forgiven for thinking that this is the main lens, but no, this is the other end of that reflecting viewfinder with the actual main lens being down here. This example is the second version of the Model B with a 20mm f3.5 fixed focus lens. The first version had a 20mm f6.5 fixed focus lens, while in June 1927 Kodak introduced a version with a faster 25mm f1.9 lens focus adjustable between 2 feet and infinity, the latter being easily distinguishable by its protruding lens housing. As you can see on this example, the lens housing on early models includes a knurled knob which, when rotated, swings in a portrait lens for shooting subjects between 4 to 8 feet away. If we undo these screws and remove the cover, we can see how this lens mechanism works. And by the way, the purplish-red tint on the viewfinder lens is likely magnesium fluoride, commonly used as an anti-reflective coating at the time. But as for why the main portrait lens doesn't have this coating, I have no idea. But if any of you out there watching know, please let me know and I will add that information to the description of this video. Beneath the lens, we have our aperture control, which controls an iris diaphragm. For ease of use, the various settings are clearly labeled by application. F3.5 and 4 for close-ups in shade, for subjects in scene on dark days or in deep shade. F5.6 for all close-ups in direct sunlight, for average subjects in scenes on cloudy days. F8 for average subjects in scenes in direct sunlight. And F11 and F16 used only for distant subjects in direct sunlight. Moving on, on the bottom of the camera we have a standard quarter 20 threaded tripod mount, while on the right hand side we have our winding crank which folds out as so. Once the spring is wound, we then push down this lever to start the camera running. When fully wound, the motor will run the camera for around 1 minute or 15 to 20 feet of film. Finally, if we go to the left hand side of the camera, we can slide this button from lock to open and remove the side plate, revealing the internal mechanism. Now the feed mechanism in this camera is rather clever. Like all cameras of the era, this uses two film spools or reels, a supply and an uptake reel. But while in the earlier Model A, the supply and uptake reels were coplanar, as you would expect, in order to make the Model B lighter and more compact, Kodak instead made them coaxial, with both spools mounted on the same spindle axis. To show you what I mean, I just needed to press this spring latch here and swing open this internal door, revealing another compartment with a spindle for the supply reel. And to show you how this all works, why don't I take you through the entire loading process step by step and show you each component in turn. Now, like the Model A before, the Model B could feed from either 50 or 100 foot reels, and to start the loading process, you pull out around 2 feet of leader, which doesn't have any photographic emulsion on it. You then swing this spring-loaded lever aside, place the reel over the spindle, and push it down until it is fully seated, then release the lever. Now this lever is part of the footage counter mechanism. It sits against the surface of the film and gradually swings inward as the film is consumed. This, in turn, moves this scale behind the footage counter window past the indicator needle. Now, since this camera is designed to take both 50 and 100 foot film reels, it is necessary to move the indicator needle to the correct starting position by sliding it as so. In the Model A, by contrast, the footage counter didn't actually measure or feel the amount of film remaining. Rather, you set the indicator to a starting position of 50 or 100 feet, and the camera estimated the amount of film left through the internal gearing, rather like an odometer. Right, the next step is to feed the film leader over this angled roller and close the compartment door. And you'll notice that the roller has a step surface that it only contacts the film on the outer edges near the sprocket holes, not the center where it might damage the emulsion. From here, we must feed the film through the sprocket, which is directly connected to the spring motor and drives the film through the camera. And to do that, we release these two sprocket clamps by sliding them back as so, and feed the film through the gap. We then feed the film through the film gate, this curved assembly here. This comprises a fixed pressure plate, which defines the film plane upon which the image from the lens is projected, and a movable spring-loaded aperture plate, which clamps the film against the pressure plate during exposure. Below this, we can see the feed claws, which engage in the sprocket holes to pull the film through the gate. Now, it's important to understand that in a movie camera, the film doesn't just run continuously past the lens. If it did, you would just get a meaningless blur. Rather, each frame is pulled in front of the lens and exposed, 
intermittently. Each frame is pulled into the film gate by the feed claws, whereupon a rotating cam presses against the aperture plate, squeezing the film against the pressure plate. Once the frame is secured, the shutter, of the rotating variety in this case, opens, exposing the frame. As the shutter closes, the gate unclamps, the feed claws pull the exposed frame away and the next frame into the gate, and the whole cycle begins anew. Now, to ensure that the feed claws don't interfere with the loading of the film, we can lock them out of the way by swinging this loading lever to the right. We then feed our film through the gate, then back to the bottom of the sprocket. And here you'll notice this bent wire guide bar, which imparts a slight twist to the film, narrowing its profile so that it won't rub up against the two flanges of the take-up reel as it is being taken up. And you can also see here the metal spring drive belt that connects the drive motor to the take-up reel spindle, which is given a half twist so that the reel spins in the correct direction. You will also notice these curved white, or rather plain metal lines, molded onto the back of the housing, which indicate the loops that must be left in the film while loading it. As mentioned before, this has two drive systems, the drive sprocket, which runs the film continuously through the camera, and the feed claws, which pull each frame intermittently in front of the lens. And in order for these two mechanisms to work together, there needs to be a certain amount of slack in the film, which is why you leave these two loops at the top and the bottom. Finally, you thread the end of the film leader onto the take-up reel, which unfortunately I don't have an example of here, and move this lever based on what size of film reel you are using. And when the take-up reel is full, this lever presses against the outer layer of the film, preventing it from unwinding and light from penetrating to the lower layers. And if we wind up and start the motor, you can see how the film feeds through the camera. And as a final note, this camera includes a number of clever features to prevent you from making common mistakes when loading the film. For example, if you accidentally start the motor without first releasing the loading lever, nothing will happen since the lever locks the feed claws in place, jamming the entire mechanism. And if you try to close the camera without closing the sprocket clamps, it won't lock into place. This is because when the clamps are in the open position, these bent up tabs interfere with these studs on the inside of the side plate. Elegant and useful. Now, the Cinecodec Model Bs with the 20mm f6.5 and f3.5 lenses sold for $70, and the version with the 25mm f1.9 lens for $150, around $1,300 to $2,600 in today's money. Better than the Model A, but still pretty pricey for the 1920s and 30s. Thus, in April 1929, Kodak released the Model BB, which tightened up the internal layout to produce a more compact camera that only took 50-foot reels. It was also designed from the get-go to take interchangeable lenses, specifically a focusing 25mm f1.9 lens or a focusing 25mm f3.5 lens. It also included an interesting feature where by pushing a button, you could reduce the frame rate to only 8 frames per second doubling the exposure time of each frame and allowing the camera to be used in extremely low light conditions. Of course, such severe undercranking caused the subjects in the film to move at twice the regular speed when the film was projected back, and so the subjects were instructed to move very slowly and deliberately in order to compensate for this. The Model BB sold for slightly less than the original Model B, $140, equivalent to around $2,500 today. However, the low film capacity was deemed too limiting by many, and the camera ceased production in 1932. The Model BB was followed in 1930 by the Model K, which was a slightly enlarged Model BB capable of taking 100-foot reels. Three lenses were available, 25mm f1.9, 25mm f3.5, and 78mm f4.5, all focusing. It also featured the same half frame rate capability as the BB. In 1932, Kodak introduced the Model M, which was a stripped-down budget version of the Model K, which by 1933 sold for only $50. However, since this model lacked many of the attractive features of the Model K, it sold poorly and it was discontinued in 1934. The Model M was followed in 1937 by the Model E, which replaced the coaxial reel arrangement of previous models with a more conventional coplanar arrangement and added an internal direct viewfinder. And in parallel with its conventional consumer offerings, in 1933, Kodak also introduced the Cine Kodak Special, which was intended for professional and semi-professional use and included a Kodak S-mount for mounting multiple different lens types and separate film cartridges which could be pre-loaded to permit quick film changes. This was followed in 1948 by the Special 2, which had a diverging or outward-splaying turret to keep the various lenses out of each other's fields of view. 
Finally, the last in the Cinecodec 16mm spool load and camera line was the Cinecodec model K100, introduced in 1955. By this time, however, Kodak had largely switched over to cartridge loading cameras, starting with the magazine Cine Kodak in 1936. In 1932, they also introduced the Cine Kodak 8, the first camera to use 8mm film. Even more compact, convenient, and affordable than 16mm, 8mm film soon became the de facto standard for home movies. But covering the entire history of 8mm movie cameras and accessories is far beyond the scope of this video, so instead let's have a look at some of the accessories that were available for the Cinecodac Model B, which included Kodoscope A, B, C, and K projectors, number 00, 0, 1, 1, A, and 2 projection screens, the Koda Toy Projection Theater for children, tripods, carrying cases, Koda light photography lamps, filters for panchromatic and Koda color film, a film repeater, which automatically rewound and replayed film in a projector, a film titler, a film humidor and storage album, a film rewinder, and a film splicer. And that, dear viewers, is a brief overview of the Cine Kodak Model B and the dawn of home movie making. I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time in another video where we'll look at yet more fascinating photographic equipment and other devices just like this one. Until then, I'm Jean Nesti from Our Own Devices, and if I don't put out any more videos this month, Happy New Year, Happy Holidays, and have a great day.